Welcome to The Uptake. This is a new show about all things tech and community. I am Anna Chu, your host, and I'll be introducing you to people all around the world covering topics in the world of tech, personal stories of professional learning, development, and community building. We're going to figure out the answer to the question together, what is community? If you have ever helped someone with a question, learned something new, or shared something you've discovered, well, guess what? You're actually part of a community. My hope is that through the uptake, you'll meet cool people in the world of tech, hear stories and get inspired and be a part of a vast and expanding community in your area and beyond. In this episode, I'll be talking with some friends at Microsoft, April Spate and Donna Saka. April is a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft, working with the spatial computing team and recently spoke at Microsoft Build. I just saw her session on DIY tech with the amazing Chloe Condon. You can follow her on Twitter at Vogue and Code if you want to learn more about extended reality, augmented reality, and virtual reality. Welcome, April. Hello. Thank you for having me. Of course. And my co-host for today is Donna. If you don't know her, well, you must be new to the community because everybody knows Donna. She is a principal cloud advocate for the Power Platform at Microsoft. And she was one of the hosts at the 48-hour marathon, which was Microsoft Build with fellow cloud advocate Seth Juarez. I definitely want to get all your tips because we're planning for a very similar type of marathon for Microsoft Ignite this September, which will be 100% digital. So welcome, Donna Saka. Ah, thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for having me. Yay, April's here. This is going to be amazing. And all of you out there listening, um, thank you for joining us. This is a weird time. And we really appreciate you taking the time to invest in not just yourself, but also the community. So speaking of community, exactly. Anna. Mm. <laughs> yeah, well, we it's it's so interesting that we're talking now. We had started planning for this podcast episode, feels like two, three, four weeks ago. Um, and that was during that time, it was really the global pandemic that was on everybody's mind. But now uh, there's so much more going on. Uh, we're seeing the resurgence of a very, very important movement, Black Lives Matter. We're seeing on the news, protests against the police, uh, against br police brutality, really. Um, lots of important calls for police reform. And I myself, along with many of my friends and family, are educating ourselves on uh, what's going on, having really good conversations with friends and family about systemic racism. And I think it's really important for us to address that today and give the community an opportunity to, to lean in to this conversation. So, you know, April, um, I just want to start with you. What would you say to anyone who is really unsure of what to do or say right now? Yes, I would highly suggest there's two things, actually. One, if you're in a position where you want to educate yourself more, then definitely do so. There, I would say within the past week, week, two weeks, if it's been so far, there has been so many folks that have posted resources for people to take a look at, whether that's reading or writing or just tuning in in conversations. Definitely take advantage of those. I myself recently took part in a conversation with two of my friends from Twilio, um, Nathaniel Quinoa and Corey. Weathers for uh, Nathaniel's baby developer Twitch stream, and we had a conversation about color. So there's conversations such as those you can take a look at as well. So that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is in a moment where everyone's chiming in with their opinion and what they have to say, you have to be mindful of the fact that it is okay to, how do I say it? It is okay to address how you're feeling and what you're learning and not be necessarily afraid of making mistakes. That was one thing that I touched upon in the conversation I had with Corey and Nathaniel was that there are some folks who, um, who, who are allies and they wanna say something, but then they're afraid of saying the wrong thing or saying, um, or saying something that might lead to just social media overwhelming of just folks timing in and giving in to what has been termed as cancel culture. And 
yeah. my response to that was that as a black woman and just I would not that I can speak for every black person that's out there, but just in general, one thing that I do feel comfortable saying is that we spent so much of our lives just being mindful and fearful of not saying the right thing. So for someone that wants to consider themselves an ally that's afraid of saying the wrong thing in this one moment, it does not compare to what we've gone through our entire lives. So um, do not remain silent. Definitely speak up. Do show your solidarity. And ensure, I have a third thing, <laughs> ensure that you're also taking care of yourself. I know that everyone's doing everything that they can within their power right now to speak out and to be activists. And that's great. At the same time, do ensure that you are taking breaks for yourself. I know myself, I took a few um, this past week, for example, and I'm sure I'll take another one on Thursday as it's my birthday Thursday. So oh. just make sure that you're taking care of yourself and um, yeah. I would say that's that's what I would say for anyone right now trying to find the words or trying to find what actions they should take. Yeah, thank you. I think it's really great to hear that people are given permission to really openly share and not be afraid of, of saying the wrong thing. I think right now we just need to have that open uh, level of communication and, and be a lot more forgiving. I've heard the term grace being shared a lot more now. Uh, which is really comforting so that people can feel like, hey, I, I could still be involved in the conversation. I have permission to be here and, and to learn. So that's really awesome. Um, and another thing I've been hearing is that, you know, gosh, people of colour, black people, they're just also feeling very tired of having to go back into these conversations and represent themselves. Like, like you must be feeling decades, if not centuries of weight of injustice as well. So, you know, you must feel super tired of these conversations, but I really am thankful that you want to talk about it in this podcast with us today. Oh, no problem. Yeah, I would say this is a conversation that many of us have been having for years. And these are issues that we've been speaking on upon for years. It's just super unfortunate that it's taken until this moment for people to actually listen. And so, yeah. It's it's tough. It, it definitely truly is. Um, I would suggest as different orgs, different companies, if you will, as well, are looking to um, to better align with being more inclusive and diverse, that whatever steps they are taking aren't taking aren't necessarily performative, as there have been mm. a, a lot of that going around um, recently as well. But ensure that it does come from a genuine place and don't necessarily leave it up to us, us being Black people, to be the ones to step out and put different guidelines and procedures and strategies in place I feel like as adults, we're all capable of doing the research and if needed, definitely reach out if you have questions, but also don't necessarily expect, don't, don't expect black people to just hand all the answers over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A hundred percent. Well, firstly, thank you, but also happy birthday for Thursday. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm hoping you spend a lot of time with uh, some self-care. So the reason why I invited both of you to uh, this episode is because you both uh, share a passion for fashion. Hey, that rhymed. Um, but you happen to work in tech. Um, April, before you got into tech, what I found really interesting about your story is that you were a menswear stylist and a visual merchandiser. So how did you find yourself in tech from there? Yeah, as I was getting ready to graduate from undergrad, I realized that working in fashion with regards to what I was doing in the industry was not necessarily going to give me the lifestyle that I wanted to live and have in my adulthood. And so Growing up, I got accustomed to things being a certain way. So then when I became an adult, my mom was more so of the, okay, you need to get a job. <laughs> so I knew that <laughs> if I wanted to continue that into my adulthood and continue to live in this way that I was, was raised and was used to, I needed to have the income to do so. And so as I was graduating, I was taking a look at what I had done in my past um, years working in fashion, as well as what I had done in school. And fortunately, I had did a program in business project management where I learned the principles of project management. And then all along while doing that, I was also working in retails um, as a menswear stylist, as you mentioned, and a visual merchandiser. So a lot of creating, a lot of working with customers one-on-one, -on -one, and a lot of educating those that I worked with on different things 
things like different merchandise that we had come into the store. So as I was trying to figure out exactly what I wanted to do outside of the fashion industry, I started looking for roles related to project management. And at that point, it wasn't even necessarily tech related. It was just project management. And what I found was that most of the roles that were available were for project managers in the IT industry. And I was confused because at no point in my program did our professors ever mention anything about having IT experience. So that was definitely eye opening. And I really had a moment where I just sat and thought to myself, how could I turn this around and show that I was capable of doing project management in terms of a role, even though I had all this fashion on my background. So fortunately, I found a internship with the Consumer Electronics Association. Now, uh, before they were Consumer um, Electronics, now there's Consumer Technology Association. They changed their name a couple years ago. But they had an internship available for IT project management. So like, what were the odds that it was IT and then project and management? So I applied and during my interview, I tied everything that I could from working in fashion to a more project management um, way of describing what I did. And I made sure to include different project management terminology, terminology into my interview. So that way it really provided me some credibility from the perspective of showing that I knew what it meant to be a project manager. And for me, a a lot of it was bringing in a lot of what I did when I was a stylist and a visual merchandiser, because there's so much planning that goes into that. And I think as consumers who are on the other side and not not necessarily working in the industry, it might look like all we do is just make store windows pretty and we make these nice displays and we just give people clothes. But there's so much more to it than that. And a a lot of it comes from a lot of planning, a lot of really having um, good conversations and asking the right questions and and ultimately providing some deliverable. And so when it came time to doing uh, my role that I ended up getting with with CTA as an intern, a lot of what I had did from a project management perspective in fashion, plus what I had learned in school, was used in my uh, first job in tech. So I made that transition over. I want to say two to three months into the internship, I had received a full-time offer with the organization, which was great. But I will say when I interviewed, I made it very clear what my goals were. And I think for some folks, that's, that step gets skipped. And I want to definitely emphasize that because when I interviewed, I did say that I wanted something permanent. And then once I got the internship itself, my manager and I, we worked together to put a, to, uh, to put a plan in place that would help me strengthen the areas that I still needed to strengthen in order to make a level of um, my role there. And so that really, I would say, also um, laid the land of how my internship went. And like I said, two to three months later, I had a job offer and that was my intro into the industry. That is so cool. That is so amazing. Um, what I like about this is you g- grew a set of skills while doing men's merchandising. And mm-hmm. a lot of people think, you know, I hear this all the time. I'm sure you hear this. Fashion, tech, those two aren't related at all. We're like, actually, they're quite related because you use the same set of skills to do both of them. And you yeah. were able to see at a quite young age that, oh, the set of skills can be applied anywhere whether it's Mm -hmm. doing a store window or running a project in an office or setting up, you know, 3D worlds. You were able to put all these skills that you had learned early, early in your career doing fashion design into the work you're doing now in spatial. So I think that's fantastic. And a good lesson for people that we live to be 100 years old, you're going to reuse your skills for something else at some point, right? And, you know, back in five years ago, advocates for spatial did not exist. The job just was not there. Like spatial didn't even exist, right? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So I think it's just a thing to remember that most of the things that we're training for now or studying for now will lead to jobs that do not exist today. So getting really hung up on what am I going to do when I grow up for the rest of my life is a giant waste of everyone's time because we can't predict that future. We could not have predicted 2020. 
<laughs> so there's no way, right? We could predict our future. You know, so I'm you know so what? excited. When I was younger, I was sure that I would become a zookeeper. <laughs> <laughs> I was that is confident. <laughs> <laughs> so you're yeah. right. Um, it, it, it is very hard to to look at where you are now and believe that the same jobs will be there because there will be so many more that don't exist. And this past year, I was fortunate enough to uh, to mentor a high school student, and I told her exactly what you just said, that there will be jobs when she is ready to enter the market that do not exist today. So to keep your eyes open and be open as well to what possibilities are available, that's that's really important part. Seriously, just yeah. learn things that are interesting to you. You will use them. I still remember having conversations with young mentees who are just fresh out of college and they're trying so hard to fit a mold. But the risk of that is that you become like everybody else. You do not stand out from the crowd. And um, mm. in talking to my manager, when he looks at people to hire, he looks for people with the most interesting backgrounds, like people who had, you know, a major in French or, you know, something else that was completely different. Uh, there's really a lot of value in seeing diversity of thought processes. The way you would tackle a certain problem, say, in marketing or engineering, if you have that different perspective, a different way of thinking about a problem, it's, it's it adds so much value to the overall team and the people you work with. So um, to anyone listening on this call, if you feel like you you know, need to fill out this cookie cutter profile, especially as you read those job descriptions, just throw that out the window. Like I yeah. know after posting roles, like HR definitely copy pastes those like mm -hmm. qualifications that you need. That doesn't yeah. mean you have to check every single box in order to apply. I don't remember the right. stat and maybe Donna or April will remember, but it's like, especially women, Mm -hmm. Women are trying to like meet 60 or 80 percent of the criteria, whereas men just don't. I can't remember where I saw yeah. that. But <laughs> it's just crazy yeah. to me. So, you know, really embrace your diversity when and put your name on the table because mm -hmm. uh, otherwise you just don't know how far you will go. So I'm going through this right now. I'm hiring for a vendor position on my team. And mm -hmm. I reach out to a young man in South Africa. He's fantastic. He's a student ambassador, really great. And I said, hey, I need you to apply for this job because you're perfect for it. You know, you'll go through the loop with some people. He's like, oh my God, I've never done project management with a third party company who that does learning tools before. And I'm like, who the hell has done that? Nobody. <laughs> this is what you will be doing, not what you must already know, right? Yeah. Most people have no idea what their job is going to be because that job is going to change within two weeks of you being there. I think a thing people forget is it's you plus the job that leads to success. It's not yeah. just, oh yeah, the manager is brilliant, has thought of everything that the person will be doing. As a hiring manager, I've hired maybe like 2,000 people in my career. I can tell you that not one of those 2,000 people is doing exactly the thing I wrote down on a sheet of paper. Because mm -hmm. I do not know what next year looks like. I do not know what three yeah. months looks like. If it turns out they're going to lead the charge for, you know, third party relationships and content creation. I didn't even know that was a thing we were going to work on until they brought it up. So yeah. the thing we look for in industry are people who are vaguely entrepreneurial. So people who are able to spot problems and say, there's a problem. I think I know how to solve it. Here's a potential solution. What do you think? Way more important than, oh, yeah, I have a PhD in solving that problem or, you know, 10 years of experience. So it's something for a next generation to keep in mind, like, just look at the job description as a not as a list of things you have to do, but as a list as a as a challenge you want to tackle. Do I want to challenge? Do I want to take on this challenge and do I want to learn things to solve this problem? Yes or no. If the answer is no, move on. If the answer is yes, go for it. Why would someone want to take on a role where there's no opportunity to learn? You know, it's it then becomes a point where you're you're just doing the same thing every single day and then there's like nothing more to it. Whereas for me, I like to look for 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 jobs where I know I can still learn. Even working in spatial, for example, what's really great about working in spatial, I will say, 
Um, compared to something like Python, which happens to be like my first real language that I gotten to know from a stronger perspective, for example, um, where Python is, is more stable, you don't see that many differences from different versions, if you will. Whereas with spatial, it seems like there's always something changing. So when working in spatial, for example, you can't know everything because it's impossible to know everything and something new is always going to happen. And I think for me, that's why I really love what I'm doing now with uh, with cloud advocacy and the spatial computing team, because there's always something new that's popping up on the scene. And then as soon as it pops up, it's like, okay, who's gonna tackle that and learn more about that? Or it just might be a matter of taking the initiative and learning more about that and coming back to the team to let them know about it as well. And I truly, truly, truly love that. And like, keep in mind also, when it comes to all the requirements that are on uh, job descriptions, if, if, if a person, and I've heard this from a hiring manager, if a candidate meets every single thing on the list of requirements, they should probably not be hired. Because then at that point, they probably need a job that's going to be a little above more than what that position is. There's, there'll, there'll be nothing for them to learn. So if there's things that you don't necessarily know, that's cool. If the job descriptions are more so tailored in a way where it's like required skills, like yeah, you definitely wanna ensure you have those skills. But for for all the ones that are nice to have, if you can hit a couple of them, that's great. I know coming over um, just into Microsoft in general with my first role, which was with the docs team, I was very fortunate to have been in contact with someone that was already on the team. That's one thing I will also suggest as well, is if you're finding jobs on different job boards and you're curious about them, try to seek people who already work at the company or even better on that team because they themselves can give you a summary of what it's actually like on a day-to-day -day basis doing whatever that job is. Uh, that way you have um, a better idea what to expect. And then also it can help you tailor your interview questions as well as you're preparing to interview because you have a better uh, grip um, of what the job actually entails. So that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I great. do. I cannot uh, agree with you more, April. Um, I would never um, recommend anyone to uh, apply for a role unless I really believed in that team, unless I believed there was a lot of room for them to develop and grow, and that that manager was freaking awesome. Um, yeah, I would hate to recommend a friend to a place that was toxic or even anything close to that. Um, that is not what I would feel comfortable doing at all. Um, so, yeah, highly recommend uh, you anyone who's thinking about uh, going to a new company, find someone that you might know who you can trust. But, of course, not everyone has the luxury of doing that. Um, April, I, I want to ask you because, you know, when you were in that space where you were a menswear stylist and a visual merchandiser and you were starting to think, okay, I want to get into this project management space and you were looking at your first group of job descriptions to, to apply for, um, what, what, what tips would you give to someone who's looking at their next career, career 2.0, if you will, um, and and preparing for, for that? Like what's, what skills should they be thinking about? How should they take that inventory to figure out how to, how to apply? Yeah, so starting off to the point you made about your inventory of the skills that you do have, you definitely want to take that into account because nine times out of 10, you have skills that will be transferable to other roles. And on the mm -hmm. surface, it might not sound like it, but when you really sit down and think about it, there are some skills that can transfer from one industry to the other. I think some folks can get really into their own heads and just assume that they must start from scratch and then they must go get this degree or must go do that boot camp and they must hang around these circles and so on and so forth. And honestly, that's not necessarily the only path you could take. I mean, if you want to take that route, by all means do it. But that's not the only way to get into the industry. When I came into the industry, it was um, I had no leads. I had no network in the tech industry. So it was really all just me seeking whatever I could find. And and I believe when I found that internship, I think that was back when it was okay to find jobs on Craigslist and that's where it was posted. <laughs> but <laughs> but, um, but really, uh, really being mindful of 
the skills that you already have. And then once you have an idea of what you're what you're capable of doing, start to start to get an idea of what seems interesting to you, not necessarily something that you want to do for the rest of your life. Because I started off as a project manager. I then went to becoming like a systems analyst and then I became a program manager and now I'm a cloud advocate. So there's there's like been so many different mini careers in tech where project management, long story short, wasn't my only career. So I say that because don't necessarily feel obligated to treat your very first role you're looking for in tech to be your lifelong career, um, your, 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 what you do basically for your career, because it can change. And that's totally cool if it does change as well. I think sometimes people feel guilty when their mind does change once they've started doing something, especially when you are leaving from one industry to another. Um, it, there, there, there may be some folks who really highly praise you in the industry that you're coming from, and they're just not understanding why you would ever want to leave. And so, don't necessarily feel that pressure and obligation to stay when it's when you want to go do something else. If if you truly want to move on and move forward, do so, but do so strategically. Um, I at one point after I came into tech from fashion, I actually left tech for a little bit to go back into fashion, and then I came back into tech. And while that's okay to do, I did not have a proper plan in place when I did that. Usually yeah. those who are the, mo the more successful of the bunch had a plan in motion to have things work. So make sure that you are being strategic about it. But in general, take inventory of the skills you have and see what can transfer. Find something that seems interesting, not necessarily something that's your forever job, but something that seems interesting. Um, if you're ready to move on to a different industry, don't feel obligated to stay in your prior one um, because other folks are trying to make you stay. If you're ready to move on, definitely move on. And then um, the last point was to be strategic about the moves that you're making. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more with you, April, on those, especially that last one. Um, I would say there's three things that I wish people would do more of when, especially when they're changing jobs or changing roles. One is when you take inventory of your skills, ask someone else, because we're actually really bad at knowing ourselves. There's things we take for granted. They're like, oh yeah, I speak all the time. I'm not that good of a speaker. People are like, it is amazing that you can go say random words about nothing for 45 minutes. And, you know, we may not think that's a particular skill, but lots of people think it is for example, yeah. right? Or being highly organized or all sorts of things that we take for granted because we are, we've lived it and grown it for so long. So ask someone mm -hmm. else who's not your mother, okay? Yeah. Mothers, <laughs> bad, bad, sorry moms, including my own, you're not a good gauge of skills. Um, so ask someone who you used to work with, like what, do you, what would you call on me for, right? There's an emergency, what is the thing you'd call on me for? And they'll give you some things you may not even know. The second thing is, April, like you're saying, when you vacate a position to go somewhere else, even though people want you to stay, there's that guilt. But there's also an opportunity for someone else who might be eyeing your spot. Yes. And yeah. you're suddenly creating the space where they know it's possible. And you, you leave and you've provided this wonderful benefit to someone who wants it more than you. And the third thing is, when you change jobs, you're in a position of power and stay in a position of power. So that's why I think what you said, that third point is so important, like be strategic. And yeah. that means while you're employed, seek your next job because you will give off a vibe of power because you have a job, it's highly paid, you know, or it's paid, you're good at it, you're appreciated at it. So when you go into a job, a, an interview, you come at it from a position of non-desperation, not hire me, I can start tomorrow, not yeah, I'll do yeah. whatever you guys want me to do. It's a matter of, no, I'm here to interview you company to see if this is better than what I've got. What I've got is pretty right. damn sweet. And if this is not way better, this is not worth my even time or conversation. So going into it from a position of power, I feel is so important especially for yep. women and minorities who often feel like, oh, I'll just take what I can get because I'm so lucky to be here. And I'm like, mm -hmm. F that. And I can say, um, and you probably also witnessed this yourself, Donna, but even from the hiring side, it's obvious mm -hmm. when someone's desperate. <laughs> Yeah, and that's it not is. always the, the 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 best candidate for the role. Right. And mm -hmm. I've 
I've, I've shared with people, sometimes I get it. Sometimes you just need something so you can make ends meet. Yeah. And I totally understand yeah. that. But then sometimes you also really want to think, if I got stuck in this role, will I still be happy? I know for some folks, sometimes they take jobs as a as, a, as just something to just fill in a space until they're ready for their next thing. And what we really have to understand, and I believe Donna touched upon this earlier because it still applies to this, is that we cannot predict the future. You might start this job under the impression that you'll just try it out for three months and then you'll head over to another company. But then next thing you know, something happens in your personal life. Whereas if you went to any other job, you don't have the same flexibility anymore. So now you can't take care of whoever's at home that you need to tend to, for example. And now you're stuck in this job that was supposed to be temporary that you really don't like. So you you really, you really want to be strategic about choosing um, where you even apply and uh, your final uh, decision on who you decide to accept an offer from. It's really important. Yeah, I really love those points. I think, you know, being going in with the strategy is really important, but also being super informed about yourself. Um, mm-hmm. Yes, like if I asked my mother for her opinion of me, she'll basically just like praise me to the moon. But talking <laughs> to people who actually have worked with me in the past, they will they will talk about different things that my parents wouldn't have perspective on, like mm-hmm. about my skills with communication or stakeholder management or whatever it might be, right? And you may be pleasantly surprised. Uh, we are always our own worst enemies, right? We're very self-critical. We like to think about all of our flaws more than we do about our strengths. Um, and mm-hmm. so, yeah, like find someone that you trust Maybe even find someone who is maybe on the slightly outer edge of your circle and just get a point of view. I mean, some people might not feel comfortable sharing, but hey, like, you know, that's that's really up to them ultimately. And and hopefully your, your ego won't be too wounded, but it also gives you an opportunity to figure out what you need to work on too, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's really important. I really, I'm really glad you brought that up, Donna. Um, what I like is to do this where if there's a job that sounds interesting, I will take the JD forward to a friend and say, what do you think about this for me? And that friend will either be one of two things. And it's always gone like this. It's obviously you're a moron. Why would you not think this is perfect? Go apply at once, right? You need those friends, the ones who are not that next to you, like extremely Mm -hmm. direct and to the point. Or you could have done this job 12 years ago. Why are you even looking at this? (laughs) You need to hear these things, right? Because we go for the things we, we can do. And we almost need someone in our lives to say, yeah, you could have done this 12 years ago. You need to aim higher. And those are the people you need in your life. Um, You know, your textable tribe, your people um, who will honestly kick your ass out of your comfort zone because you do need it. We all imposter, right? We all imposter syndrome sometimes like, oh, I've never had a director level job. So can I apply for a director level job? Like genius. No one was born a director. (laughs) Everyone has (laughs) that. You know what I mean? Right. You need that friend. And that's why I rely so much on um, just getting an outsider's perspective on things. Because we in our head, we're psychotic. We're like schizophrenic squirrels the way we talk to ourselves. It's not helpful. So just having a third party weigh in and just say, what are you thinking? Yes, go do this or don't do this. Or here's some ways to think about it really, to me, helps so much. So, so much. Yeah, I, uh, what April said earlier about being in your own head sometimes is exactly that. Uh, and I know, John, you talk about imposter syndrome, what you talk about it. You've done sessions on that vanishing spell as well. Um, I like. I've had so many conversations with people who just basically took themselves out of a role. Donna and April, like, what are your tips for someone who who have those thoughts in their head and don't know where to go next? I would say when it comes to imposter syndrome in general, really have to find where the source of it's coming from. And I think since we're currently at a time where just so many people are on the internet and social media, if you sit on there all day and you tune into what's happening in the developer community, for example, it can look and appear as though so many folks are exceptionally well knowledgeable and more knowledgeable than yourself. And 
some folks might know more. That's just how life is. But at the same time, you can't let that get to you because we all learn at different speeds. We all have different ways of how we learn. Some of the folks who are more active in the community, for example, they have been doing this for years. I've met folks that's been doing this since before I was born, for example, you know, and you you, you would expect them to know more. That just makes sense in my head. But then there are also... Um, folks that are just starting out and it might seem as though they're just breezing through everything and they get everything and everything makes sense. And there are cases where that happens, but sometimes most of us, I would say, we fall somewhere in the middle of that spectrum of knowing a lot and starting to learn and learning super duper fast. But then there's those that just takes a bit more time and understand and realize that your own journey is your own journey. You shouldn't compare it to anyone else that you see because you don't necessarily know what other background that individual had while learning, especially if you want to think about taking inventory of their skills, for example. I know for me, I don't have a tech background, but I had a linguistics background. So for me, um, learning syntax just became more natural because I spent so much time doing it while um, while while working within the area of linguistics in undergrad. So there, like you just never really know what people have in their own little toolkit that's that's helping them um, uh, become more comfortable with what they're learning. In addition to that, when it comes to imposter syndrome. The point was made that you can talk yourself out of something. And what really sucks is when you see someone else do it and then you sit back and think, oh man, if I didn't talk myself out of it, that could have been me or I could have been further than that now or I could have been as successful in my career and so on and so forth. But it's all because you sat there and talked yourself out of it. So do understand and realize that a lot of the the, the self-doubt that you're giving yourself, at the end of the day, it's really just hurting you. And if there's something that you really want to try out, just go do it. I recently was, um, I took part of a, of a stream with, uh, you mentioned Chloe earlier, it was Chloe. And um, it was talking about just my background as well and my transition. And one thing that her co-host, she had said to me after the end of the stream, she said, April, you have this, this thing with you where you very nonchalantly say that you saw this thing you wanted to do and you just tried it and then you did it. <laughs> and I'm like, well, yeah, why don't people just do that? Why don't people just see things that they want to do and then they just go do it? And even if you don't have access to like the, all the resources that you need, there are ways around it. I mean, when I got started working with extended reality, for example, um, I didn't have a device. You know, like in itself, devices are hard to get. And so I didn't let the fact that I didn't have a device stop me because there were still so many more learning opportunities online without having the device that I was able to take part of. So when it came time for that day where I was able to actually get a device, guess who was ready to use a device? Because I spent so much time learning everything else that I could. And so I feel that for some folks, when they want to learn something, they just get so caught up trying to trying to figure out if they're capable of doing it. And um, that can really slow down uh, the progress that you can be making. If there's something that you really want to pursue and try out, go do it. And worst case mm -hmm. scenario, you might not like it after you do it, but at least you can say you tried it out and you know for a fact that it might not be for you. And then there's also some instances where you do try it out and it's taking a little longer for you to get it. And it doesn't mean that you should quit, but I think at that point, you 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 do need to think to yourself, is this something I want to keep trying to pursue and get better at, or should I pivot and try something else instead? Really great example. Um, when I was younger, I was a tap dancer, um, amongst other forms of dance as well. And there was, um, there I think they were drawbacks. I could not get drawbacks in class to save my life. And mm -hmm. I, like the, the girls in class, they were laughing and making fun of me because I couldn't do it. And so I went home and for that week from one class to the next, I literally sat there in the kitchen practicing drawbacks until I finally got it. And then by the time I went to my dance class, I had it. And so I say that because I could have very easily just said, I can't do this one move, forget tap dancing, I'm done with dancing. However, I, I put the time and effort forward to ensure that I had enough time to practice and just to get it and understand it. 
And I think that's really important. And, and that's the same concept um, that I, or the same approach that I take even now in my adult life when it comes to learning all these different technical things, especially working in the area of, of spatial, because there are a lot of concepts that are brand new to me that I have never heard of a day in my life. And on the outside, it can look overwhelming. And then when I see so many other folks in the industry share all their projects that they've made and such, yeah, it, it can be, it can be kind of like disheartening to just feel that you aren't capable of doing that. But then when you break down the different projects and ideas that they share and you have a chance to actually look at where those gaps are in your own learning, then you can truly see that, oh, if I go and learn X, Y, Z, that'll then make sense for this part. And then I'll be able to understand how they did this and how they did that. And so it, it's 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 really a matter of of, of, of just not letting everything get to you. And I, I feel that it can be a very natural feeling for some folks and I get it, but don't let what everyone else is doing make a negative impact towards whatever it is that you wanna pursue and whatever you wanna do. And one final point on imposter syndrome, I knew coming into my role that there would be opportunities to speak to like audiences, for example, especially on this technology that I just started learning last summer, for example. So talk about imposter syndrome in itself that I just started learning this last year. But um, coming up soon, I'll be doing um, a talk uh, on um, something that I created in mixed reality. So it's amazing to see that progress that I've made, plus more important, feeling comfortable doing it. Because if you had asked me months ago to give a talk on a mixed reality topic, I, I would have said, well, maybe not this time, let's let someone else do it. But now like I'm confident, I'm excited for what I'm gonna talk about. And I'm going into it feeling that even if there are folks that may try to stump me during like the Q and A, I know the parts that I do know, and it's okay to, to, to say that you don't know something. So mm -hmm. that's my thoughts on imposter, <laughs> my, my many thoughts on imposter syndrome. So I have a question. When is your talk exactly? Because I want to- Yes. So it's going to be June 22nd in Altspace VR. And okay. if you do not have a device, that's A-OK, -okay because you can also join via desktop as well through the Altspace desktop app. So um, it's it's a really cool project that I'm sharing. I, I like to have my projects focus on education. And so it's an educational experience that I created um, for, in my case, it's with HoloLens, but essentially you, uh, you don't need the HoloLens to do it, but I'm using the HoloLens, so. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. I love it. That's awesome. So that's something everyone should check out because you know that's going to be cool. Um, what I really love about what you said about learning to learn is we all have our own ways that we learn things, right? You and I share a way, which is you just got to go do the thing. I don't learn by reading or by observing others. I have no idea how people can learn by doing those things. I have to mess up. I have to get in, I have to mess up. And only once I mess up, do I actually understand what I'm even trying to do. Mm -hmm. And But others learn a very different way. That Some learn by emulating the masters. Others learn by reading and watching 100 videos. Others learn by um, observing, going away for a while and thinking deeply about it. But your learning style is what you already know what it is. It's the thing you've used to learn to do anything, whether it's you know fourth grade math or some coding thing or whatever it is, you use the same freaking style and you've refined it through through uh, time. So just use that same style to learn things. Um, and the other thing I'll say is there are so many people looking for a step one. So mm -hmm. I am a huge fan of beginners and things because the beginner way today is not the beginner way a month ago. Right. They're just different because there's new shit now. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt this with Power Platform. I'm like, what? There's already a bunch of experts. I don't need to create beginner content. My most widely read and shared content, I'm not kidding, is building your first power app from an Excel spreadsheet. That's it. Yeah. yeah just like people have done this a hundred times. People are like, yeah, but we actually, there's more people in the world who don't know what that is than there are yeah. that do know what it is. Just the sheer number of people who are beginners, just by numbers, it's in the millions. And the people who are experts is in the, what, thousands or hundreds or something like that. Right. So beginner content is always probably the most read for a reason. And it's the most appreciated by people. So I highly encourage people, 
go start your thing, whatever your learning style is, and document. This is my learning style, and here's what I'm doing with it, and here's what my beginner journey looks like. Because first, you're relatable, everyone likes you. And second, you get to relate to more people who learn like you. And Mm -hmm. the fact that you're not afraid of looking stupid shows a Mm -hmm. tremendous sense of power and a sense of confidence. Mm -hmm. So I have no issue looking like a moron. I'm like, oh, I'm going to build a business card reader. I don't know how to do that. I'm going to figure it out on camera in front of, you know, 250 people. It's fine. It's everyone fine. starts from the internet anyway, right? And exactly. everyone's yeah. a beginner from from day dot, right? So yeah. if that documentation is out there, that video is out there, someone's going to look for it. And yes. And good luck to them if they can continue their journey, but they always have to start from the very beginning, right? Uh, So that's how it goes. Um, One thing that I find really interesting is that, you know, for us, we all work at Microsoft and we're all pretty active in the community. And I think right now, especially with current times, we're all feeling a lot of support um, in the community and we're very encouraged by the conversation that's being had with uh, with the black community, people who are Indigenous and in people of colour. Um, one thing that I really loved, I was just trolling through your Twitter feed, Donna, and I saw that you were talking to a conference organiser and you asked if you could add a speaker to that lineup. And they said the lineup was full. And you said, well, great, can they have my spot then? <laughs> and so they were like, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, we'll make some room, which is amazing. <laughs> so, I, I want to pivot the conversation more about how can we be better supporters of the community? How can we give back? And you close that tweet with, you know, everyone can create a bigger table. So, um, yeah, let's start with Donna and then we can t- go to April. But I'd love to talk a little bit more about that. So I fully believe people don't realize their power. Mm. I'm a firm believer that nobody, including the three of us, understand how much power we have in this world. And everyone assumes that the people around them are more powerful. And when everyone assumes that, no one knows how much power they have, right? So everyone assumes everyone around them has a whole arsenal of swords and knives that they use to fight battles in their garage. And in fact, none of us do. Or in fact, all of us do. So it's one of those things where even the most early career person can be such a strong ally right now. Because we can raise our hand and say... Let's open a door for someone who deserves it, right? And I think one thing, and this is for all of you allies, co-conspirators, and friends of minorities, and especially uh, Black people, own your power to help others. And you have more than you think. And stop offering to mentor people. It's a giant waste of time. Everyone knows what they're supposed to be doing. It's not a secret. Um, What they need are opportunities, So that's all people want is our opportunities. So my entire mission is to create opportunities and I can create opportunities all day. And so can you. So this was an opportunity I created. No one's like, oh, we have an open spot. Donna, do you know someone who can take it? No. Um, It's saying going out of the way and saying, oh, there's a conference. It's virtual. Why can't we add another session? And I'm going to ask this woman of color to be a speaker there because I don't believe we have enough women of color speaking at this conference. But there's so many people who can do that, right? Nominate a black person onto your board, um, recommend a black person to go um, apply for that job, have someone, you know, write a really good recommendation, open doors, right? I'm such an advocate of open doors. Allies, that's the best thing we can do right now. And you can open doors for the high school kid, like April, you were saying, you know, high school kids, middle school kids, college kids have a help a high school kid write a college essay, help a middle school kid write a high school essay. There's so many things we can do, but we just have to understand how powerful we are. And, and please always remember everybody, it takes so much more strength to lift someone up than to push them down. So the most powerful people in the world spend all their power lifting people up. So go do that. I think it's really important to ensure that I would say from from my perspective, once you make it to a certain point in your career to always reach back and bring other folks along. I think for some folks, when they reach a certain part of their career, they feel, well, the table's full. 
I can't bring anyone else with me. And if I do, there will be competition. And that's not necessarily how things should work. Um, I feel that we should not view those who are not in the same position um, career-wise as us to we don't we shouldn't view we shouldn't view those individuals as our competition. If anything, adding them onto um, the workforce and our projects and what we're working on is only going to make it stronger. It'll make it better. And so I think it's really really important to to be able to feel comfortable bringing folks on board and not feeling like they're there to take your job. You know, so that's one thing that's super important. When it comes to allyship, though, I would say. Being able to amplify the voices of others is a really, really important matter that I feel that a lot of folks who do have um, a larger platform or who are one of those individuals, especially in this, in this industry, that um, as, as, that is seen as a credible um, resource, I think it's really important for them to um, to share the voice of other folks that people might not know about. Because unfortunately, what happens is no one ends up finding out about that individual or a very small subset of folks hear about that individual. And then it really does stump them with regards to where they could be in their career. Um, another thing, I actually want to piggyback on what Donna had said with regards to knowing what our own power is. That I feel is very, it's something that unfortunately can be overlooked internally if we're not aware of just how powerful we are as individuals. Um, I won't share the individual's name, but it's a person that is um, widely known in our community. And we had a chat recently, whereas um, this individual had mentioned that someone had said to them that what they say holds a lot of weight. So therefore, if they could mention different um, different uh, folks or like minorities, for example, in these conversations, that actually holds a lot of weight. And that individual, they they admitted that they weren't aware of just like how powerful their own voice was or is. Mm. And so they agreed to ensure that they they were able to um to, to mention people's names and conversations and to also um to also share what their experience was like working with that individual because I think for some of us um use myself for example let's say that um let's say we had an intern, this is complete top of my head. Let's say we had an intern and that particular intern was really hoping to get a position that was permanent with Microsoft, for example. And let's say I worked with them and then everything was great, internship ended, and then that was it for the conversation. And then this, and then this individual, they're trying to look for it, they're trying to get a job, but no one was there to support them. So now it really puts a blocker. Whereas myself worked with this individual, in a sense, I want to say we should feel obligated to highlight the success of those that we've worked with, especially if they are in terms of levels below us. Since at Microsoft we have levels, if they are below us, um, it is great to ensure that their managers know what work they've what work that they've done. Um, I hate to say it, but unfortunately, we 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 live and work in a society where. It's not always a matter of of um, of me just speaking to my accomplishments. We really have to quantify everything, or we really have to have someone else say that, oh yeah, that person is good, so you should also hire them. And um, is it right? No, it's not right that there are times where folks just don't believe us what we have to say. But that's also why it's just as important as allies to ensure that if we have these really great working opportunities with folks or we know the type of work that they're doing in the community, let people know, amplify that. Don't just keep that to yourself and just brush it off as just someone else doing this other thing in tech. Like share that, talk about it because it really holds a lot of weight and very important conversations. And then once mm -hmm. typically I would say once that individual does get to that level where they've been onboarded for example, more than likely they're bringing other folks with them and then that cycle continues. And that's how we're able to create a more diverse workforce, especially here in this tech industry. And um, one thing I will say is that as you are helping folks out and as you are, um, when, it, when it comes to being um, allies and such, yes, it's great to, to, to share where you stand on those matters, but not everything has to be 
not everything has to be, how do I say, promoted on social media that I did this great thing for this person and I did this other great thing for that other person. I know mm. for me personally, if I can curse for one second, I do a lot of shit behind the scenes <laughs> for, for folks, you know, and I just don't spend all day on my social media feed talking about it because for me, what's more important is that this person was able to get to where they needed to go versus me patting myself on my back to show folks that I'm helping out other people. So if you are helping helping people out, don't do it just for applause to show that you're a good ally. Do it from a place of, of being very genuine and wanting to help folks out. And I, I can promise you it'll be that much more rewarding when you are doing it from a place of being sincere and genuine. Yeah, there was so much in that. <laughs> I, one, it reminded me of something that I've, I've learned at Microsoft and sadly, uh, most of my career has been with Microsoft. Um, but take it or, or leave it. Um, I've certainly learned that you cannot burn bridges. Everyone remembers everything. Everyone talks about each other. And they're just facts. It's not meant to be a criticism of anything. And I don't think this is just uh, stereotypical of just Microsoft. I'm sure it is with other corporations mm -hmm. too. But people remember when you've lifted them up. People will remember if you push them down. And mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, that table as well, again, to, to the earlier point about competition, if you are there to enable other people and empowering them, they will remember and you will have them as allies for life too, right? And they will also mm -hmm. take from your example and also look to mentor others or lift others up or give them opportunities. It's all, and maybe I'm a bit Pollyanna about this, but I really feel this is a very cyclical thing. If you put really good positive vibes out there and, mm -hmm. and lead by example, others are totally going to follow. So, you know, this yeah. happens in, in corporations and in companies and organizations and communities. So I, I really like seeing that. Um, sadly, the, you know, you do remember the bad apples and it's because they are – somehow lacking awareness of the effect that their behavior is having on others. But the same also applies to, to positive behaviors, to encouraging behaviors. Um, people yeah. remember everything. So I don't know yeah. if that's a word of warning, but certainly it's a lesson that I've learned over the course of the few years um, mm -hmm. and I've applied it to everything I do now. So true. <laughs> Well, I know we've talked a lot and we're totally over time. So I really want to thank April and Donna for having this conversation today. Um, I've borrowed this tradition from Donna is to give homework to our listeners. Um, April, do you have anything that you'd recommend our listeners do after listening to this episode? Yes, I would say with regards to um, transitioning career, my homework for you would be to go spend time seeing what X type of person does an X role. Because I feel that we get so caught up reading job descriptions of what a role entails, but you really don't know what it's like until you speak with someone that's either done it or until you do it yourself. And so if you're in the middle of transitioning, then you probably haven't done it yourself. So the next best thing is to speak with people who have done those roles. And um, I feel right now we're at a time where it, it, it seems a little easier to, to get in contact with folks because most of us are at home. So if you, if you have a chance to reach out to people who have uh, jobs that you think you might like, or even ones that you're just a little bit um, you know, into, but maybe not, check those out too, because it might be, it might end up being something that you actually love and do want to try out. But the homework I would say is go talk to folks who are already doing the jobs that you want to do and get a feel for what their day-to-day -day is like. And that'll hopefully bring a bit more clarity to you for which path you should set out on with regards to transitioning careers. Love it. What about you, Donna? I like that one because it's go talk to a human. Don't go watch YouTube yeah. videos about it, but go talk to yeah. a real person about the real job. So mm -hmm. my homework is specifically for people who claim to be allies or for people who are afraid to be allies it's actually fairly straightforward. You treat someone else as you would a very, very good friend or your own brother or sister. So what you do, there's really three steps, ready? I right, write this down. One, identify the person who you'd like to help. Two, go talk to them and see what is a challenge they're facing. Do they wanna change jobs? Do they want a speaking gig? Do they wanna write for the New York Times? Do they want to um, get promoted? What is their specific challenge? 
And three, if you can, open a door for them. So that means amplifying their ask for a new job, um, writing a nice mail to their manager, helping fi them find a speaking gig, uh, retweeting their voice. If they've written a book or um, done anything of the sort, amplify the book, go get the book, mm -hmm. write a review, that kind of thing. Do exactly what you do for a good friend or your sibling. Be a fan. You know, forget being an ally. Be a fan. What would you do for someone you're fan, you know, fangirling or fanboying about? Be a fan. It's the best thing we can do for our community because everyone needs more fans. No yep. one needs more, you know, non-fans. Perfect. Well, I appreciate you both so much. Thank you so much for this great conversation. I learned a lot. And on behalf of all our listeners, thank you for sharing your experiences and perspectives. Uh, even though you both have a connection in fashion, I know we learned a lot about learning about allyship, about community, and that switching careers is not impossible. It can be done. And many have done that impossible, seemingly impossible task. So, yes, I highly encourage you, all our listeners, to Follow April on Twitter at Vogan Code and Donna at Donna Saka. Uh, and they mention a lot of different resources. Do the homework uh, and you certainly will benefit from all of that. Uh, you can find the blog for this episode on the Microsoft Tech Community at techcommunity.microsoft.com. The tech community is really close to hitting half a million members. So if you haven't joined already, please take a look. Uh, you'll find a whole bunch of community hubs ranging from Azure to Humans of IT to Windows. And there's a lot of different resources to help you on potentially your next career journey, including blogs and Microsoft Learning Paths. You can also find community events. So, and so many are happening right now. So start reg registering and please attend. They're doing a lot of work in the community. So make sure you prioritize that. The Uptake is on Twitter at The Uptake Pod. You can also follow me on Twitter at underscore a chew. Please subscribe to the show. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and more. We also post a video recording of the uptake on YouTube. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a review. It helps us spread the word and the community love. On behalf of the Microsoft Tech community, thank you for spending time with us today. I'm Anna Chu, and I'll see you next time. Thank you, Bye. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Do the thing. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>